welcome once again to our discussion of the scriptures of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Joining me today for our discussion are three members of the Department of Ancient Scripture from Brigham Young University. Seated to my left is Professor Richard Draper. Welcome, Richard. Thank you very much. Good to be here. Across the table from me is Professor Eric Huntsman. Welcome, Eric. Thank you, Terry. And to my right is Professor Ray Huntington. Thanks for coming, Ray. Good to be here again, Terry. Well, brethren, today we're going to return to our discussion of the book of 1 Kings. We're going to start with chapter 17 and the ministry of Elijah. We love Elijah. Uh, you know, he held such a special place in, in LDS theology. Elijah has a kind of a special challenge here because just prior to his appearance on the scene, um, the religion of Baalism, sometimes we say Baal, I'm going to say Baal, um, that's what it is. That's what it is. Well, that's one way to say it. Um, has become the state religion. You know, for a long time, we didn't know much about Baalism, but we know quite a bit about it now. And uh, understanding a little bit about that will help us understand Elijah's ministry. We know now that Baal was a, was a god of, of thunder and lightning and rain. He was a storm god, and he was tied to the land of Canaan, and that... Um, Whenever it rained in the land of Canaan, because he had opened the windows of his great uh, palace on the top of Mount Carmel there in, in northern Israel, that there were times, according to the mythology surrounding him, when he was dead and death ruled over the world. Uh, that's during the time of the, in the Holy Land when it doesn't rain. That there's times when, that when he's alive and there's lots of rain. There's times even during the raining season when there's no rain because Baal is chasing women or he's hunting or he's sleeping or doing something. And we know that... Um, that they really were steeped in the worship of Baal, that it was a very spiritually seductive faith for the Israelites. They just, they just couldn't leave it alone because it seemed to explain the climate and because it seemed to be important, worshiping Baal seemed to be important for agricultural success and because the worship of Baal didn't have the same moral standards and requirements and, and um, because they start to syncretize Baal with Jehovah. And, and there's just all these issues that make it so attractive to them. And so here comes Elijah and he has to confront these people and convince them that Jehovah is God, not Baal. Well, it's good to say what Elijah means in Hebrew, right? It means? Jehovah is God. Jehovah is God. <laughs> Even his name bears that testimony. And this is the God who controls the elements, not Baal. So how does, how does Elijah tackle the problem? Well, first of all, I'd like to just underscore a point you made, but just so that, that, that our viewers understand uh, something that uh, Ray point out at, uh, pointed out in an earlier session, and that is Elijah is coming up not against Baal alone, but he's coming up against the state. In other words, uh, with the marriage of Ahab to Jezebel and her bringing the Sidonian religion in and therefore cementing it even more fully within the kingdom of Israel, we have a state religion. And therefore, boy, you, he's moving against the most powerful people there are. And look at the number of priests of Baal there are, you know, 400 that uh, serve at yeah. uh, Jezebel's table, and then 450. That's a lot of service. And yet, we do have hints in the text that many, not many, but some people in Israel were staying faithful to Jehovah. Mm -hmm. We Thank know there are 100 prophets that there prophets. are. Which yeah, we have to go into hiding to yeah. Jehovah, yeah. you know. But, but I, think, yeah. I think that's one of the lessons that uh, the Lord is going to mm -hmm. teach Elijah, is that it's not as black as it appears, that the Lord is, has the foundation there. I think it is interesting that the sign that the Lord gives Elijah to show that the Lord is God, sealing up the heavens, would strike so much at the very heart of Baalism. Yeah. He's the God of rain, but the heavens are going to be sealed. In the name of... of Jehovah. 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 Mm -hmm. That's in chapter 17, verse 1, isn't it? Read right. that for us, will you? And Elijah the Tishpite, who is of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord of God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. Now, according to my word is interesting. Uh, one of the things that for Latter-day Saints is important is to connect Elijah with the example of Nephi, the son of Helaman, in the book of Helaman, oh. that when he receives that sealing power in Helaman 10, you can seal the heavens. And it, it's just very interesting to me that the Lord has entrusted this to Elijah as yeah, that, his representative. Let me just uh, underscore that one. It, it, to Nephi, that you've just referred to, the Lord says, I have seen thy unwearingness in well-doing. Therefore, 
whatever you say. And therefore, we come back and we see uh, Elijah really picking up the same kind of, un I mean, we, you know, he's just popped up in the text and we say, who was he yeah. before? Right, we, and we talked about this a bit before we came on the air with the viewers. Elijah appears in the text, but that doesn't mean he was unknown to, to the, the people. Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. he comes right in Ahab's presence. Ahab doesn't say, who, you, who are you? Uh, kind of like Abinadi has come before and he comes up later and, and our editors just having us focus on this particular episode. There's another point here. I guess I'll make a quick point here. Sealing the heavens from rain, that's pretty impressive. But do. But do. Yes. Yeah. It's how, been no moisture in the air. Oh, right. How, how no. often have you have the Mediterranean Ocean there and that dew just sweeps in at night, even during the dry season when there's no rain, you can walk across the ground in July in the early morning hours in, in grass and your tennis shoes are soaked because yeah, of it. Exactly. Right. Jerusalem gets more inches of dew than we get inches of rain exactly. in the Great Basin. Yeah. And now that dew is shut off as well, they are going to be dry, very dry. Mm -hmm. Famine comes. Even Elijah has yeah, to deal with it as well. He's fed at the yeah. brook Kenneth yeah. for a while. But that's, that was one of my favorite stories as a child, is that the Lord provided for him. You know, the ravens bringing the, the bread. And, uh, and when that runs out, he goes to find um, this, particular, this widow. particular widow at Zarephtha. Um, what a story this is. This is one that you need to you need to wean your children on for the principles it teaches. Uh, maybe I can invite one of you just to kind of summarize what happens in this account. Uh, Elijah is inspired of the Lord because there is a famine in the land to uh, go to Zidon and he finds this widow who is running out of food. This, this isn't just an Israel phenomenon, this Lebanon, the whole area has been affected by this. And uh, he approaches her and said, have you got something that you would be willing to feed an old man? And she says, I, I really don't have anything. I, I'm going to make our last cake. My son and I are going to split it and then we're going to die. And then Elijah challenges her, if you are willing to feed me, and he challenges her in the name of the Lord, which says something about the faith of this Gentile woman. Mm -hmm. Well, and she is from Phoenicia, where they worship Baal, but yes, she responds to prophet, but the Israelites don't. don't. Yeah, the irony. And so he goes in, of course, uh, she feeds him, and then for the rest of the uh, famine, the cake never runs out. The meal never runs out. We teach that prophets are a type of Jesus Christ, and this is symbolic or similar to what Christ does as he multiplies the fish and, and, and the loaves as well. Oh. Um, this is a, he's multiplying the oil and the, it's not like when my wife makes carrot cookies and they last and last and last. <laughs> They're actually eating this stuff. And it's still trouble. Lasting, oh, no. <laughs> and lasting and lasting. You know what else is interesting here? This is such a pitiful story. I'm going to use the last of my oil, the and last of my meal, and then we're going to die. Mm -hmm. And he has the audacity to say, make for me first. Now, if I was that woman, I would say, you know, because no. if, if you make, make for me first, then you'll have plenty for you. And uh, I would say, no, 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 wait. You give me plenty, and then I'll make for you. But what's the point? Well, but she, it's her faith. Well, she, and the she, Lord can provide life, and that is illustrated in the next section. Yeah, the next When the story. young boy dies. dies. Also as well, and he can bring Elijah, Elijah is one of the great types of Christ. Mm -hmm. And we see Elijah doing these wonderful things in the Old Testament, and then we see Jesus doing, doing the, the same, same but better. Mm -hmm. If he's going to multiply food here to feed a few, Jesus will feed thousands. thousands. Yeah. And not only that, I love the little statement here. Where he, you're right. He goes to her house and said, first, use that food to feed me. Um, you see it with the Samaritan woman at the well. She's coming there to get, get water for money. herself, for her family. And Jesus says, get me a drink first. And then the discussion, he says, if you knew who it was who was asking you for water, you'd ask me and I would give you living water. And that's what, that's what Elijah's got for this woman. So we have to invest a particle of faith. We have to exactly. show we're willing to be obedient. And then yeah. the blessing The blessing come. comes. Well, the famine doesn't accomplish all its purposes, as you know, as we move into chapter 18. Um, the, the, um, the king, Ahab, is still persecuting the prophets of God. They've gone into hiding. Elijah goes to um, and wants to have an audience with him and finally manages to set this up. I think it's interesting. 
as Ahab finally comes to Elijah, he knows Elijah has filled the heavens in the name of Jehovah. In chapter 18, verse 17, the first thing he says, and it came to pass when Ahab <laughs> saw Elijah, this is King Ahab, he says, Art thou he that, that troubleth Israel? Israel? <laughs> Are you the one that's causing me all this trouble? Elijah what? says, Not me, it's you in your father's <laughs> yeah. house. <laughs> you know, isn't that interesting? Yeah, he tries to shift the blame. It's so irresponsible of him. <laughs> yeah. And so Elijah decides the way to settle this issue <clears throat> is to put on a grand show. Um, Ray, why don't you summarize for us what happens, how Elijah oh, tries to make is, the point. This is, this is such a wonderful story. And it really is, is sort of um, what you would call trial by ordeal. And what we're going to do here, what Elijah is going to do, is pit Jehovah, the God of the Old Testament, against Baal and his priests. And so he, in a sense, invites them to, uh, to come to the top of Carmel, which is, as you said earlier, Terry, is sort of the home of, um, of Baal, Baal. But it also used to be a place, it was a high place for Jehovah. There was an altar there at one time. So a perfect and, place uh, to hold the contest. It's a good place. We're going to find out who's who. And uh, so we have this um, contest beginning with uh, the altars, uh, the, the priests of Baal, they bring uh, their bull, they, sl they slay it, they place it on the altar. And the contest uh, revolves around the challenge of, of consuming that sacrifice with fire from the gods, either Baal or Jehovah. So they lay the and whole altar out, but they can't light a fire They can't themselves. touch it. And it should not be <clears throat> hard for Baal to light his own fire no. because he, he has, has the... Exactly. He's, he's the man. He's and, really and, playing and, into exactly. Baal's hands oh, yeah. in. I mean, the odds yeah. are, if you add it all up, what, 850 yeah. against one, we're in Baal's backyard, <clears throat> and I've asked him to do something Baal certainly ought to be able to do. And, and he's got his priests. I mean, he's got the whole team. And they get to go first. And yeah. they get to go first. Yeah, I love point. Elijah. He's He's... <laughs> He's sarcastic as well. <laughs> Look at verse 27. They came to pass at noon that Elijah mocked them, meaning the priests, because they're they've got the point now where they're a little frustrated. They're actually slashing themselves with knives and then acting sort get of offering, attention. "Come and help us and yeah. light this." And um, you might want to know why. What, what's, oh. the, what's the uh, what do the winners get and what do the losers get? You lose the trial by ordeal. You lose your life. That's right. That's exactly. That's what's what going to happen here, I and mean, they know it. Uh, and he says, cry aloud, Elijah says, to referring to Baal, for he's a god. Either he's talking or he's pursuing or he's in a journey or pre-adventure. He sleepeth and must be Well, that's interesting because Terry mentioned at the beginning a little bit about the worship of Baal. Yeah. And, and these are all things that are part of his mythology. He you know, he, he does go yeah. hunting or pursuing. He does walk. He, um, does he is dead sometimes yeah. and comes alive when they called him back and that kind of thing. And so he really is... Kind of doing what we're told not to do in missions. We don't mock the opposition, but <laughs> yeah. Elijah gets to. The altar is built. Uh, well, anyway, uh, the priests have their turn, and they fail. And now it, it's Elijah's turn, and uh, he, he reconstructs the altar built of 12 stones. He slays the uh, animal, lays it out on the altar, but he does something else as well. He takes water and he drenches the offering, he drenches the altar, he actually has a ditch poured around it so the water can flow into the ditch and, and it's collected there. Uh, and um, then he says something in verse 37, hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that thou art the Lord God, and that thou hast turned their heart back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, the Lord, he is the God. The Lord, he is the God. And I think it's interesting the way they say it. The Lord, not he is God, but the Lord, he is the God. Yeah. Well, Baal we never, is we no longer there. Word. Yeah, I, I always think this is a little bit of poetic justice <clears throat> because the Lord, it's small caps there, so that's Jehovah. Jehovah, he is, he is God. God. Jehovah, he is the God. Yeah. And Elijah's name meaning Jehovah, Jehovah is my God. Oh my God. He would have kind of heard them chanting his name. <laughs> As the whole host <laughs> is chanting this, he's like... Yeah. <laughs> and so he's made the point that people recognize it and they're going to be faithful to Jehovah for a few verses. For a while. Yeah. Just, it, doesn't seem to, it doesn't seem to affect the government. No. Uh, when the message gets back to Jezebel, what's happened, instead of repenting, she's angry. She says, I'm going to, I'm going to catch this man's life. I'm going to, he's going to pay for what he has done. And apparently she is able to get the message to him. Yeah. I mean, she says, by this time tomorrow, you will die. 
Yeah. And then, so he has to head off. Imagine how Elijah's feeling. Talk well, about that day. I mean, he tells us how he's he feeling. In 1904, Read that. he goes out into the wilderness, but he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came down and sat under a juniper tree. And he requested for himself that he might die and said, It is enough now, O Lord, take away my life. I'm no better than my father's. I, they couldn't do it. I you know, and this is it. kind of the yeah. motif of the sad prophet. I mean, I, you don't want to say depressed prophet, but you read Second Nephi 4 in the Psalm of Nephi, and you look at Nephi, the son of Helaman, you know, after he preaches from the tower. And prophets can get discouraged because of the wickedness of the world, and they know that people should repent. And here Elijah has done everything. All his pyrotechnics, oh. all of his special effects, he's done everything everything he could. He's exercised the power of God righteously, and he feels like he has did, succeeded. Did, 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 did the job. So God needs to teach him. There's, uh, there's something he needs to learn. Where does he take him to learn it? Out the wilderness? The well, it says the Horeb, um, the Horeb, 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 but that's Mount Sinai, right? Yeah, yeah. So he's going back to where Jehovah first made a covenant with Israel and said, yes, Israel's gone astray. Let's go back and start over. <laughs> and, it, yeah. and it's interesting. <laughs> How did God initially introduce himself to Moses and the children of Israel? Well, you go back and read the text in Exodus. The, 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 the mount was uh, a, flame. a flame. There was There's smoke and thunder and earthquake. And, earthquake and, and, and all those things come again, but yeah. that's not God. That's not the message that he's supposed to hear this. So time. Elijah makes the trip. It's a long trip. Four but he days. had some, had some power days, bars to get there, right? Seems, yeah. Well, maybe not, right? And then he's, days. He's, he's sitting Moses there. Elijah and the Lord. <laughs> Chapter 19, verse 9, and God comes to him and says, What are you doing here, Elijah? What doest thou, Elijah? And, and he laments, you know, I, I'm just a failure. I'm such a loser. And God says, Get up to the mountain. I want to talk to you. And he goes up there, and then what happens? The Lord passes by, and a great and strong wind rent the mountains and break in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. And I like the, the Hebrew on that one, one, one translation that uh, I read of that one. He heard the sound of gentle quietness. I love that. Gentle it's beautiful. quietness. So, what's Jehovah trying to teach Elijah? I mean, why does he go through this whole circus and all the special effects and things? You know, well, I... Th oh, go ahead. Well, well I, just, I was just oh, going to say, uh, Eric really picked it up, but I just want to uh, underscore the idea, and that is nothing that Jehovah did was against anything that... Uh, nothing... Uh, Elijah did was against the will of Jehovah, okay? But Elijah may have set the agenda. You know, the mm -hmm. Lord is honoring him. Mm -hmm. Whatsoever thou doest, the Lord's honoring him. But there could have been, and I think this shows that there was another way. Exactly. I mean, this is a, this is a man of power, and everything associated with him is power, it's high drama, it's yeah. dramatic, and, and it didn't work. Well, and that's it because didn't work. we're told that signs don't create faith, but signs follow faith. And all of the dramatics of chapter 18 didn't convert the people, no. but the Holy Ghost could have. There's a lesson in that for us today as well. I think sometimes we want great spiritual manifestations in our lives. We want, we want the, 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 the mighty sound of God as if coming from Sinai, and it doesn't. It's in that still, small voice. It's very quiet. It's very gentle. It comes often and frequent. All right. Something I thought of as, as Richard gave us that alternate translation, the gentle quietness. I thought of the prophet Joseph Smith in Liberty Jail, be still and know that I am God. And taking this as a type, the earthquakes and the wind and the fire, I mean, this can represent the emotional turbulence, the other problems we have in our lives. And if we let them carry us away, we're all in turbulence. And Elijah was depressed and upset, and he may not have been hearing the Lord as he would otherwise. We have to be still. We have to have that gentle quietness so that we can discern the will of the Lord. Elijah had a lot to think about as he left or have been and traveled yeah. on, on his journey. What a, what a great teaching experience for him and one we do well to, to remember. And if we could just point out, if you don't mind, Terry, verse 18 of chapter 19, the Lord says, Yet I have left me 7,000 in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed to Baal. 
and every mouth which hath not kissed him. So yeah, you haven't been a total gonna, failure. That's right. You, we, you're going to go back now, yeah. and that's your that's your core. We're going to we're going to. God puts him back to work. He gives him yes. three things he's supposed to do in verse 15 and 16 here of chapter 19. And the Lord said unto him, Go return to thy on thy way. You know, quit belly aching, get back out there. So the baptism fell through. You need to go to work, right? right? Go return on thy way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when thou comest, anoint Hazael to be the king of Syria. One job, another. Jehu, the son of Nimshi, shalt thou anoint to be the king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of abel shalt thou anoint to be the prophet in thy room. So we even get to choose your successor or anoint him successor. And, and, and work with him. And, and so we find in these next chapters that we're going to look at that Elisha, Elijah gets the message. He goes right to work. And, and starts doing what, what he's supposed and to. And is successful, is wonderfully right. successful in the face of this organized opposition. Very well, good. and everyone that he picks has a part to play in the drama that unfolds. The king of Syria will vex Israel, Jehu will overthrow the house, the current dynasty. But it's interesting that most attention is given to the selection of Elisha. Oh, yeah. yeah. And you get described, the, you know, the eventual passing of the mantle. Um, and, of course, this will be picked up later, but... The Lord is going to work his will. He hasn't really totally abandoned Ahab, at least chapter 20 seems to suggest that, because he's going to help Ahab um, have some victory over their, their arch rivals or enemies, the, the Syrians. They're going to have a couple of battles. They'll win them both. But Ahab, again, in spite of the fact that Jehovah's helped him, he's still not going to recognize his hand or do what Jehovah asked him to do in, in destroying, uh, destroying the Syrians as they're supposed to. And um, he gets the message again verse 42 of chapter 20. Um, because thou hast let go out of thy hand a man whom I had pointed to utter destruction. This is the prophet speaking to, uh, to, uh, to Ahab. Therefore thy life shall go for his life and thy people for his people. And we see how that prophecy is fulfilled in the next couple of chapters. Yeah, and we might just want to underscore that, that Ahab had a direct command, a direct command through the prophet from the Lord that you do not let Ben-Hadad go. You let him go, he's going to bring so much uh, bad upon Israel. Therefore, he has forfeited his life, and then Ahab lets him go. Yeah, and maybe because his name was Ben Hadad. Hadad is another name for Baal. Oh, Baal literally yeah. means Lord, but a proper name is Hadad. So Ben Hadad would be yeah. son, son of, of the Lord. Throne name of King of Syria, and obviously they're very steeped in the worship. Co-religionist here. Yeah, kind of, yeah. yeah. He was his cousins. Now, before Ahab is destroyed, we get another justification for destroying him in, in chapter 21, the story of Nebot and uh, what happens with the vineyard. Uh, boy, there's some great principles to teach here. Uh, would one of you like to kind of quickly summarize that story for us? Well, uh, Naboth has a, a vineyard, and apparently a very nice vineyard, that bumps up against the royal palace. And uh, Ahab uh, lusts after the vineyard. He really wants that piece of property. And so initially he does that which is proper. He offers to buy the property. But uh, Naboth is in a position, if he sells the property, he's actually going against the commandments of the Lord that are set down in Deuteronomy. That this family property. Bingo, that's exactly right. He has no right to sell the family property. He has to hang on to that family property. And so Naboth is within his right not to sell. Well, uh, Ahab just gets all down and blue about it. Je Jezebel comes in, sees her husband's blue. He says, I want that piece of property. I can't have it. And so she goes to work. And what she does is she gets false witnesses um, to uh, testify against Naboth. So they have a, a, what, a kangaroo court. Well, the irony is that they'd heard him blaspheme not only the king, but God. Yes. And have Jezebel involved in somehow blaspheming God. God. <laughs> yeah, that's just really something. And so on the strength of these uh, two false witnesses, Naboth forfeits his life. And Jezebel and Ahab think we did it. Yep. And they bought into this, to this terrible lie that the adversary sows in the minds of people to get them to sin, that it's, if you do something wrong, it's okay if you don't get caught. It's all right to sin well, because there's this no one will ever know. from the Book of Mormon that you may murder and get gain. Yeah. You know, secret combinations from Cain on, that's a conspiracy and no one will know, as you say. And then they learn the sad lesson that even if no one else knows, God always knows. And we'll, there's always accountability. What's the accountability? Well, it's always, you can go back and look at uh, earlier events in the Old Testament. For example, with David, uh, he knew what he did uh, with Bathsheba's yeah. husband. He kept it quiet. 
Uh, no one really knew because Joab had carried out the, the, the terrible plans to have him put to death and yet Nathan drops in on him, tells that parable and then says, thou art the man, God knows what you've done and you'll pay a price for it. And, and here's the same thing going on. Uh, prophets are revealers of truth and God speaks to them and in the same case here he comes to Elijah and or Eli uh, Elijah comes to, uh, to Ahab and then he tells him, well, I know what you've done, so does God and you're going to pay a price for this. Ooh, and the price is really It's something. heavy. Yeah. Yeah. Dog is going to lick First, up your blood. Yeah. Yeah. Verse 19, in the place where the dogs lick the blood of Naboth, shall dogs lick thy blood, e lick thy blood, even thy, notice the, the emphasis on even thy, I mean, we're talking about somebody else's blood, it's your blood, and so on. And then Jezebel, verse 23, Jezebel also spake to Jezebel, also the Lord spake, saying, the dog shall eat Jezebel by the wall of Je Jezreel. Of course, the next chapter of the prophecy against Ahab is fulfilled. The, the one against Jezebel, we have to wait till the ninth chapter of Second Kings. Yeah, but so it's going to be away. It's pretty unpleasant. Yeah. It's unpleasant. They don't eat all of her, but they eat it. They, <laughs> <laughs> just about. Chapter 22 begins with a little bit of change in the politics. Um, there has been real tension, war enemies. Judah and Israel are enemies up till chapter 22. And then there comes uh, a righteous king in Judah. There's been one before, a man named Asa, which means healer, and he was kind of a righteous king, and there was some progress made in the kingdom at that time, and now along comes Jehoshaphat, who also is, is a good dead. king. Um, he, uh, he does something no previous king has done. He, he mends fences, doesn't he? Mm -hmm. He decides, I'm going to make peace with Israel. We're, uh, we're brothers. We're going to be allies. And uh, he even joins with uh, Ahab and in Israel in a battle. And this is sometimes perplexing to people because Ahab is so bad, Jehoshaphat is a pretty good king. Why would he ally himself? We don't get a good picture of what Israel is like under Ahab in the house of Omri from just our text because they're focusing on the sins. But Israel was prosperous and strong outwardly under their leadership. Mm -hmm. And probably Jehoshaphat and Judah was were forced into an alliance. They were essentially vassals of Israel at this point. Is that correct, Ray? Yeah. And Jehoshaphat's yeah. son will marry yeah. um, Ahab's. Yeah. Ahab's daughter. There is some peace that's going to last until the time of Jehu, and then war will, mm -hmm. will, will come in between the two of them as well. And the prophecy against Ahab is, is fulfilled in chapter 22, at, towards the end of it. Ahab goes out to battle contrary to the counsel of a prophet, and, um, and he's slain in the battle. And they bring his chariot in. And, and wash it off. Wash it off, and they both vineyard. The dogs come and lick Well, Ahab blood. is bad to the end. When, when the battle turns against them and the, and the Syrians are trying to kill Ahab, he takes off his royal garments, and then he tells his, I guess, his son-in-law, or, or I guess his relative by marriage, Jehoshaphat, his little vassal from Judah, go out there in your kingly robes and tries to get his friend killed <laughs> so he can get away. I mean, there's just nothing redeeming about Ahab. Well, we know that uh, his successor has a short term on the throne and then a new dynasty will, will arise in, in Israel and Ahab has learned a sad lesson that if you're a covenant people, you need to serve Jehovah. Thank you.